What happens when self-defense is against the law? What happens when the protectors become the predators? What happens when innocents are betrayed? Imagine that two-thirds of all Americans disappear. A hundred and seventy million people. Or that the countries of Germany, France and Spain are virtually wiped off the map. A hundred and seventy million people. Gone. In the 20th century, that's how many innocents were slaughtered, tortured, starved, mutilated, worked to death, bayoneted, hanged, annihilated at the hands of their governments. They had no means to defend themselves. World War I is underway. A new government has taken power over Turkey's crumbling Ottoman Empire. The rulers say they want to rid the country of wrong and lawless ideas. They want to protect national security. They decide to eliminate the Armenians from Turkey. Eliminate the Armenians by killing the Armenians. In February 1915, Turkey's political leaders and Muslim religious leaders make a detailed secret plan to annihilate the largely Christian minority. To reduce opposition, they lie about their intentions. The rulers proceed step by step. The first move, draft as many Armenian men as possible into the Turkish army. Thousands report for duty. The Armenian soldiers are then separated from their units and sent to labor camps where they are worked to death, starved, or murdered in groups far out of public view. Not all of the men are gone, however. The next step, confiscate all weapons from Armenian civilians. Finding many guns is not hard. Turkey already has a gun control law requiring gun owners to report themselves to the government. Then comes the order. All Armenians must turn in their guns or face severe penalties. Policemen and soldiers go from house to house ransacking homes and torturing people to get their guns. Armenians become so afraid of torture that they buy guns from other Turks, just so they can have something for the soldiers and policemen to take away. On June 26, 1915, the final stage of the genocide begins. The government proclamation declares, all Armenians will be deported to remote camps, no exceptions. Armenians have five days to get ready. They may bring only what they can carry. Armed guards gather the Armenians, mostly women, children, the old and the sick into groups of between 200 and 4,000 people to form convoys. The guards force march the Armenians over rough terrain and into the deserts during the hot summer months. People drop from exhaustion, are killed by the guards or simply left to die. Sometimes the guards shoot or cut to pieces all the Armenians in a convoy. Fewer than one in ten survive the march, and most of the survivors are butchered in the end. The death toll is staggering as planned. One and a half million Armenians, men, women and children, have been eliminated from the earth. Three quarters of the Armenian population of Turkey. In the early 1930s, the outside world believes the Soviet Union is a paradise for workers and peasants. But for millions, that paradise is hell. In those years, the people of Ukraine, 
the Volga Basin and the Caucasus are being deliberately starved to death by their own government. The groundwork for that cold-blooded famine was laid when the communists came to power in 1917. Almost immediately, they passed a series of laws making it nearly impossible for non-party members to own firearms. They used licensing laws to tell them exactly who had guns, and with that information, they confiscated firearms. Penalties for possession of weapons grew more and more harsh. The Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, fears enemies everywhere, but especially in Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe. Ukraine's prosperous farmers crave independence. Stalin craves their grain to pay for industrial expansion. In 1929, Stalin decrees that all farmland, livestock, and produce in the Soviet Union belong to the state. Farmers are ordered to surrender their land and livestock and move to government-owned collective farms. But first, to terrify the rest into submission, several million of the most prosperous farmers are sent to forced labor or killed outright. These kulaks, as the best farmers are called, are demonized and excluded from society. Armed government thugs steal their property, sneering, eat, drink, and be merry, for it all belongs to us. Next, Stalin demands extraordinary quotas of grain, quotas no one could possibly meet, quotas enforced by soldiers with guns. Many farmers rebel, resistance is fierce. But because of 10 years of firearms confiscations, the helpless people can fight back only with farm tools or sabotage. The worst is still to come. In 1932, Stalin takes the ultimate revenge on those who dared oppose him. Because Stalin controls all food distribution, he can cut off food supplies and starve entire regions because he controls all travel with internal passports, his secret police can force starving millions to remain within the devastated lands. Grain elevators stand full, but grain rots on the ground as Stalin refuses to distribute food. The powerless people can do nothing to stop their master. Catastrophe strikes and lasts for two endless years. Spies watch for anyone trying to take grain from the fields. Anyone caught hiding food is executed. Desperate families resort to cannibalism. Meanwhile, the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning Moscow correspondent Walter Durante assures the world that there is no famine. And Stalin dupes the world by actually increasing the amount of grain exported from the Soviet Union. The United States and the League of Nations embrace and recognize the prosperous Soviet Union. From Moscow, Times reporter Durante secretly confides the truth to Western governments, that as many as 10 million defenseless lives have been wiped out with politically engineered starvation as the murder weapon. Chinese culture is built on obligation and obedience. The individual serves family, society, and state. Law governs the masses, but rulers stand above the law. The people easily become pawns. 20th century China is filled with turmoil and war. In the early years, nationalists vie with communists for political control. By 1935, the nationalist government, now in full power, prohibits private ownership of arms. A person can be punished, even if he violates the law unintentionally. But the new laws do not bring peace to the disarmed and obedient citizens of China. 1942 to 44, four million die in famines aggravated by government confiscation of crops. 1937 to 1949, 
the Sino-Japanese War. Men who refuse to be drafted into the army are tortured, mutilated, and killed. Many uncooperative soldiers are shot or starved to death. The toll, another four million. And in 1937, there is Nanking. 225,000 Japanese troops advance on the city. 300,000 Chinese soldiers flee, throwing down their weapons in the path of the oncoming Japanese war machine. Hundreds of thousands of children, women, sick and old people are left to the mercy of a merciless foreign invader. Lacking any tradition of self-defense and forbidden to own firearms, the people of Nanking are cornered and helpless. They are raped, buried alive, burned alive, used for bayonet practice and forced to watch as their own organs are cut out of them. Even a visiting Nazi observer is horrified. More misery is to come. When the communists take over in 1949, they impose their own laws to discourage and punish firearms ownership. The most harmless forms of gun ownership are forbidden. Yet the communists themselves are lawless under Chairman Mao's drive to produce an ideal society. From the agrarian reforms of the 1950s, to the cultural revolution near the end of Mao's reign. Men, women, and children are treated as tools of the government or as enemies of the state. During 38 long years, communist violence and economic experiments wipe out an additional 35 million Chinese and possibly as many as 100 million. Chairman Mao said that guns were the ultimate source of all political power. He controlled all the guns. January 1933, Hitler is elected to power in Germany. Because of a gun registration law passed just five years earlier, he already knows which Germans own firearms. Nazi government agents combine primitive brutality with modern record keeping to conduct mass seizures of weapons from political opponents. Violent raids and obedient gun turn-ins also reduce ordinary Germans to helplessness. Within months, the Nazis have firmly consolidated their power. But this is not enough. In 1938, they create their own gun control law. November 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Incited by propaganda minister Goebbels and led by Nazi government agents, Germans commit a nationwide attack against the Jews, shattering storefronts, looting property, burning synagogues, committing murder. The day after Kristallnacht, the Nazis forbid Jews to possess any firearm, club, or sharp-edged weapon. Violators face five years in a concentration camp. Jews turn in their weapons to the police or the Nazis storm in after them. Stripped of their power to resist, Germany's Jews await slaughter. Technology helps the Nazis make savagery efficient. Census data and national ID cards tell them exactly who is a Jew. In a few days of terror, between 30,000 and 90,000 Jewish men, mostly community leaders, are arrested and sent to concentration camps. It is the beginning of the final solution. The so-called Jewish problem now being solved, Hitler can focus on preparing for world war. All over Europe, men and women resist the Nazis, but not in Germany, where Hitler is able to find and seize their weapons. Three million German political opponents are imprisoned in concentration camps 
between 1933 and 1945. More than five million Jews slaughtered. One million children. Gypsies, Slavs, pacifists, critics, the disabled. More than 11 million total die in concentration camps. Nearly 21 million civilians throughout Europe perish at Hitler's hands. Cambodia has existed for centuries, but after 90 years under French domination, the country is in chaos. In 1975, following five years of civil war, the communist Khmer Rouge seized power. Led by dictator Pol Pot, they set about purifying the country. Communist regimes elsewhere in the world had aimed to establish paradise on earth someday. The Khmer Rouge want it now. Their idea of paradise means eliminating all religious leaders, monks, nuns, priests and preachers, political enemies, city dwellers, Vietnamese and members of other undesirable ethnic groups. All traces of Western culture or capitalism all students and intellectuals, professionals, anyone who can speak English or French or who has more than a seventh grade education. Merely wearing eyeglasses marks people for death squads. The Khmer Rouge don't need any new laws. Their will is the law. But ever since a series of earlier uprisings, Cambodia has had tight restrictions on firearms ownership, such as laws restricting the number of weapons. And permits so strict that a firearm owner can't even loan a gun to a family member. Combined with Cambodia's poverty and non-violent Buddhist traditions, these laws ensure that very few Cambodians own firearms or are prepared for any form of self-defense. Anyone who fought against the Khmer Rouge and any civilians who own firearms are forced to disarm the moment Pol Pot takes power. The defenseless people are unaware and unready for what is to come. Khmer Rouge force mass evacuations of the cities. Believing the evacuations will be temporary, Cambodians neither resist nor take enough food to survive. The move is not temporary. The entire population of the country, those who are not slaughtered outright, is herded onto collective farms to labor without homes, personal possessions, or families. All of Cambodia is turned into a concentration camp, brutally administered. No one can receive mail or phone calls, books or skilled medical care. All human relationships are shattered. The simple act of saying a kind word to a child is punishable by death. The methodical evacuation and slaughter fit well with Pol Pot's goal. To reduce Cambodia's population from 7 million to about 1 million primitive agricultural workers. Year by year, 
For the next four years, the Khmer Rouge murder Cambodians at a rate eight times higher than that of Nazi Germany. More than a quarter of the country's population dies before Vietnamese troops invade with machine guns, helicopter gunships, and tanks. It takes them only a month to put a stop to the madness. In Uganda, 300,000 undefended people die, yet few outsiders care. The world turns its eyes away. It is the hidden genocide. When Idi Amin comes to power in 1971, the world's political leaders embrace him. Amin overthrows dictator Milton Obote, who had banned political parties, killed opponents, and enacted a socialist agenda. Abote's government had also passed laws forbidding private citizens to possess firearms. Only government officials and other friends could get permission. Abote had been unpopular. And who could be worse? Surely not big, strapping Idi Amin. A clown who sometimes jumps into swimming pools in his full-dress general's uniform. But Amin is not merely worse. He is unspeakable. He immediately orders the slaughter of all soldiers whose loyalty he doubts. 16,000 men disappear in the next few months. Next, Amin claims that God has instructed him to throw every Asian out of the country. Then all the English people must go. Amin confiscates their businesses and land to give to his cronies. Uganda plunges into chaos. To prevent resistance, Amin makes it illegal for three or more people to be together if one of them is armed. Firearms are seized at Amin's whim. Amin's personal agents run amok. They torture and cruelly mutilate their targets, mostly Christians, rival tribes people, and anyone Amin or his soldiers just happen to dislike. The dead include a university vice chancellor, an Anglican bishop, a Supreme Court justice who dares rule against Amin's whims, and the Minister of the Interior, who is dismembered alive. Death squads sometimes make victims lie down in gutters to make their blood easier to wash away. Most Ugandans have no arms and no power to resist the killer regime. The orgy of slaughter continues for eight years. In 1979, Amin is finally overthrown. Saudi Arabia welcomes him as a guest, and there he lives for decades in peace. The smiling monster never faces prosecution for the death of 300,000 innocents. Ninety percent of Rwanda's population belongs to the Hutu tribe. About nine percent are Tutsi. The tribes often intermarry, but rivalries have simmered, especially since Belgian colonial rulers in the early 20th century gave political authority to the Tutsi minority. By 1994, a Hutu regime has been in power for many years. Some Tutsis have threatened rebellion, and the government has responded by calling all Tutsis rebels. The government has fueled a campaign of hate, preaching violence against Tutsis. State-controlled radio stations call for the extermination of the Tutsi. And in April, it begins. The grave is only half full, one radio station declares. Who will help us to fill it? Thousands of murderers help in an unspeakable frenzy that lasts 100 days. Government troops participate. So do armed Hutu gangs 
that have been issued weapons for the purpose. Weapons are sometimes crude. Machetes, axes, nail-studded clubs, and blunt instruments. Some attackers use firearms. But the helpless Tutsi and those Hutu who oppose the government often have nothing more than rocks. Laws and poverty have kept the victims from getting weapons to defend themselves. The Minister of Defense controls permits for weapons and keeps a registry of those few people allowed to possess firearms. The Minister of Defense is also the chief organizer of the nationwide killing campaign. If victims can find or make weapons equal to those of their attackers, then they stand a chance of surviving. In Kigali province, civilians huddle in a church compound, using rocks, bows and arrows, and a single gun seized from a dead soldier, they hold off attackers for a week. Eventually, they are overwhelmed by troops wielding grenades. 5,500 die. In one town, the mayor urges villagers to disarm, saying the police will protect them. When they refuse, he orders police to shoot them. The war of rocks against bullets in that town lasts three days. In the end, 20,000 townspeople are massacred. Across Rwanda, tens of thousands hide in schools and churches. They are besieged and beaten or shot to death. To catch people trying to escape the killing, roadblocks are set up throughout the country. Soldiers check national ID cards. Unarmed, defenseless people whose cards identify them as Tutsi are slaughtered, man, woman, and child. Merely to be who you are is punishable by death. But of course, these horrors struck other people far away. People who are different from us. Countries that are different from ours. Surely, it can't happen here.
The United States, at its best, is a great nation. Yet here, too, people can become powerless targets. They may suffer simply for being who they are. It is the 19th century. Up to four million Americans are slaves, entirely without rights. A quarter of a million free blacks live among them. Many work to outlaw slavery. A spirit of rebellion grows. And among the white majority, fear grows. Maintaining total control of slaves becomes an obsession. America's earliest disarmament laws are designed to keep one race, and one race only, helpless. Slaves rise in rebellion, tension increases, and states pass even more laws to control blacks. In 1865, the North wins the war between the states, ending slavery forever. Three years later, the 14th Amendment extends full citizenship and equal legal protection to the former slaves. That is, the law extends equal protection in theory. When states can no longer pass laws like this, they pass laws like these instead to keep guns out of the hands of poor blacks. Disarmament does not bring peace or safety, certainly not to blacks. Between 1880 and 1965, mobs lynch nearly 3,500 black people, sometimes for serious crimes, sometimes for mere insults against whites. So-called respectable citizens snatch defenseless men from jails or from the streets. They abuse, torture, mutilate, and kill their victims. Yet defensive power sometimes prevails. In Columbia, South Carolina, a 14-year-old girl stops a lynch mob from seizing a prisoner by holding the mob at bay with a revolver she doesn't even know how to shoot. Today, lynchings are a thing of the past, but some things never change. Purchase a gun from a licensed dealer, and even now you must reveal your race. Another group of people is stripped of its weapons with tragic consequences. From the first arrival of Europeans on North American shores, relations between whites and natives, called Indians, have been uneasy. As settlers push further into Indian lands, the situation boils. Each side commits and accuses the other of committing atrocities. In 1864, U.S. Army troops gunned down 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho members at Sand Creek in Colorado Territory. Most of the dead are women, children, and old people. Inevitably, the better armed whites overpower the tribes. Near the end of the century, desperate Indians of many tribes adopt a new religion. They believe if they perform a certain ritual, called the ghost dance, the whites will be magically swept away. In late 1890, the ghost dance sweeps the reservations of the Lakota Sioux. Whites fear the Lakota are planning a war and try to force the ghost dancers to halt. Although many Sioux give up their religion, some bands refuse. The army is called in to transport the ghost dancers out of the territory. In December 1890, the last band of dancers is pinned at Wounded Knee Creek. Ordered by the army, they hand over a few dozen rifles. But believing the whites plan to kill them, young men hide weapons. While the soldiers search the camp, a medicine man begins the ghost dance. The soldiers think he is giving a signal to attack. Somewhere in the band of Indians, someone discharges a rifle. The army opens fire. The 
battle is over after just 10 minutes of heavy fire. But soldiers pursue the retreating Indians and gun down everyone they find. The bodies of women, babies, and old men are scattered as much as three miles from the battlefield. When governments fear the people, disarmament often follows. The law may target one group, but other individuals pay the consequences. World War II. President Roosevelt issues an executive order authorizing the War Department to exclude any and all persons from vast military zones. The order doesn't identify any group, but everyone understands it means people of Japanese ancestry. Of the 110,000 who are rounded up and sent to camps, more than two-thirds are American citizens. They have committed no crimes. Being citizens doesn't protect them. They are disarmed as enemy aliens. Ironically, the U.S. government soon recruits young Japanese-American men from these camps and the young men go on to become part of one of the most highly decorated infantry regiments to fight in World War II. Some German and Italian Americans are also taken to camps without being accused of any crime. Those imprisoned include American-born children. Like the Japanese, those sent to camps are disarmed. Some U.S. citizens are even deported to Germany. When they have defense tools equal to those of attackers, people have the power to protect themselves. Once powerless, people can fall victim to any aggressor at any time. October 16, 1991, a bright sunny day in Colleen, Texas, a crowded coffee shop. Young doctor Susanna Grasha is lunching with her parents. She often carries a sidearm for self-defense, but today she has left the gun in her car in the parking lot because it is illegal for her to keep the weapon in her purse. She's afraid she'll lose her license to practice if she's caught with it. Susanna Grasha is about to lose something much more precious. A truck crashes through the window. A man leaps out and methodically begins shooting customers to death. Susanna reaches for her purse. Then she remembers. Self-defense is a hundred feet away, and the police can't come for endless minutes. Susanna can only watch and then scramble desperately through a window as her father and mother are murdered. Twenty-three people die on a bright, sunny noon at Luby's cafeteria. On the early morning of August 23, 2000, the children of John and Tepany Carpenter are alone in their rural California home. All five Carpenter children know how to shoot, but California law requires that guns be locked away from children. With her sisters and brothers still in bed, 14-year-old Jessica enters the family kitchen, where a half-naked stranger awaits her with a pitchfork. The stranger has barricaded the doors and windows. He has cut the phone line. There is nothing to stop him. Stalking down the hallway, he begins stabbing 13-year-old Anna. Youngest sister Ashley, just nine years old, leaps into the hall and draws the madman away. Horribly wounded, Ashley dives at his legs, screaming for her sisters to go, go, go. The girls all think of the gun but they can't use it to save Ashley or their little brother. The three oldest girls escape. They rush to a neighbor's house and plead for his rifle, but the neighbor says no, saying the government would take his gun away. By the time police arrive, Ashley is dead from 138 pitchfork wounds to her face, chest, and neck. Seven-year-old John William also lies dead, stabbed 46 times. 
Once people accept being disarmed, they become surprisingly easy to control and to kill. They have surrendered not only their weapons, but their independence. When innocents are rendered so defenseless, the guilty can slaughter them with the most ordinary of weapons. A club, a knife, a pitchfork, or these. Some may consider the position of this film a little extreme. They may think that the idea of personal self-defense against a killer government is an extreme idea. 
But in fact, if you look at the history of the world, and certainly the history of the 20th century, you look at the nations where the people had power, they weren't persecuted by their own government. If you look at the nations where the people didn't have power, they were subject to persecution. And in genocide after genocide in this film, we show exactly how that took place. This film does have a message. It has a, a moral of the story, as it were. It's a connection of three ideas. Betrayal of trust, vicious cowardice, and powerlessness of victims. Any individual who acts in some way to try to stop people from protecting themselves, any individual who would uh, work to disarm people, and oftentimes that's known as gun control, the idea that a person should not have the tools to defend themselves. Anyone who, who is willing to be part of the process of rendering the citizens defenseless is to blame. The Founding Fathers fully expected that Americans would be prepared at all times to fight a government. When the government becomes the enemy of the people, the Founding Fathers fully expected that the people would rise up against that government. It's right there in the literature. Alexander Hamilton wrote about it in Federalist Paper Number 29. Uh, James Madison, considered the father of our Constitution, wrote about it in Federalist Paper Number 46. They expressly expected that people would take to arms and stop a government that went too far. So they built into the Constitution the Second Amendment to be sure that Americans would never become the disarmed subjects of this government, to make sure this government never became a killer government, and to make sure that the scenes we saw in this film never could take place in America. Every American, maybe everyone in the world, but every American who, who has any interest at all in the future of a free nation, of a safe nation, of a prosperous nation, should also be a person who is interested in how to preserve that kind of nation. And the way to preserve that is to never give anybody more power than the people have. The warning sign on the horizon now is this drift in America and in Western civilization to downplaying the importance of self-defense, the downplaying that, that key value. And it, that's what this film is trying to get across, is that self-defense is the job of the individual. It's not the job of the authorities all the time. The individual ultimately has the duty and the right. And as we see Western civilization moving away from that, trying to centralize the defense of, of the society and take away the power from the people to do that, this movie shows the history of what happens to people who have been rendered powerless. There are about three things that we can't really do with this, this documentary. One of them is to communicate the impact of actually being there. We show uh, still photographs and footage, but it doesn't really get across what it's like to be in the presence of brutal murder, what it's like to, to see the dead eyes of the killers in the killing squads, what it's like to, to, to see the panic and feel the fear in a persecution and an extermination. We can't give you that right there up close and personal. Another thing that we can't really get across is the sense of time. Again, we have short photos and, and, and video that people can see, but we can't give you the sense of what it's like to live day after day in dread and fear in a persecution. The endlessness of living in, in a prison camp or the lifetime of scars, nightmares, and phobias that survivors live through. That sense of time, we just can't get it across as well as we'd like. Uh, another thing is the pain of mind, the, the, the thoughts in, in the mind of a survivor, for example, who would replay over and over in his head, I wish I'd seen the warning signs. I wish I could have done something about this. I wish I'd had a weapon. I wish I could have fought back. I wish I could have protected my family members who were killed or, or persecuted. That, that's, that, that pain of mind never goes away. As a kid growing up in uh, Tucson, Arizona, I was raised by my uh, grandmother. Most of her friends were Holocaust survivors. And I learned at an early age that there's 
there was always something very wrong with the picture, if I can put it that way. You always saw stacks of bodies at the death camps, but none of those bodies were holding a gun. But next to the bodies, you might see a Nazi soldier holding a gun. So it became pretty obvious to me, and perhaps in my Arizona environment, that uh, a lack of being able to defend one's life had an awful lot to do with making it possible for governments to kill you. I thought this was a story that had to be told. It's a story that most people do not understand. It, it, it's, a, it's a history lesson that most people are not getting in school. And the best way to tell people in America is to make a visual presentation instead of expecting them to read a book. So we set out on telling people information that lots of folks that would, they, would rather they not know. And uh, among them are, are folks who are supporting gun control schemes. And we wanted people to understand the downside of gun control, the side of gun control you never hear about on the 6 o'clock news. And to bring all this information together over the years and be able to put it into a visual presentation was not only a fascinating experience, but I think we finally have put the right package together to help people see that how evil gun control is. No longer do they have to read a book now to see uh, the, the foundation of a genocide, the steps that are taken. No longer do they have to read books, although I wish they would, but uh, to, uh, to, to grasp the big picture. It's all here now. It's, it's within the film. I think this documentary has the potential to save lots of lives. And it may only be about an hour long, but it's an hour that can change the course of human civilization, in my opinion. Because the more people who understand how the game is played, if I can phrase it that way, the more people who understand how dictatorships come into power, I think, and the more people that we can convince to be armed, and then I think the more people we'll be able to save. And if we can save more human lives, then that means there'll be more people who will be able to control government. And never again will people fear their government. And that's a key to preventing future genocides. I'm hoping the people who decide to watch this film are those that are concerned about the preservation of life people who realize that they are their own first line of self-defense, people who do not want to be victims by an oppressive government, people who are opposed to police states, dictatorships, tyrannies, people who really care about their families. I hope that uh, people who already believe in gun ownership uh, will watch this documentary so that they can tell others about the evils of gun control schemes. They can help others understand how horrors happen to people who are defenseless. Well, my goal for the people who see this film is to help them have the knowledge, the information of the history of gun control and how it has been so horrible and how it has brought about so many tyrannies and police states and dictatorships and, of course, genocide. And I think that people need to think about how horrible these situations have been. And I ask people to imagine a world that is free from genocide. And, it's, and then imagine a world that uh, there, because there is no gun control, there is no death by government. You know, producing this uh, documentary had some high points and some low points. And one of the most disheartening areas was dealing with so-called humanitarian groups. They always go to the public and say, gee, we want to help save lives, send us money. And when we went to one of these large humanitarian groups, the United Nations, and asked to use some of their photographs of Rwanda and Uganda, they initially said yes, but then they realized that we were opposed to gun control. And they made it very clear they would not work with us because we believe in the preservation of firearms ownership. And so my message to people concerning humanitarian groups is that if you want to give them money, well, that's all well and good, but maybe you should just ask what their position is on firearms ownership, because most of them do support victim discernment policies that make police states, dictatorships, and genocide 
possible. Well, I think there's a very clear message in this film for American military personnel. And it's a message that they unfortunately don't get in high school before they go into service. And I'm not so sure it's even a message they get while they're in the military. But one of the reasons American military personnel are put in harm's way by being sent to foreign lands is that the people in those lands fear their government because they can't control their government. Their government has gone bad. Their government may be killing them. And all of this came about largely because the people are defenseless, which means they do not have access to firearms. I think September 11th was a good example of the uselessness and the futility of gun control laws. When you think about how several hate-filled terrorists were able to take over airplanes using box cutters and pocket knives, and they got away with it. They were able to murder thousands of people because no one on these planes was able to defend their life. No one had a gun. And I think that this is a lesson that is not being learned in America or throughout the world. If you want to stop criminals, you have to speak to criminals in a language they understand. And if they want to be violent against you, then you have to use violence against them. And I think that governments do get scared. And it's dangerous for people, because when governments get scared, they do scary things. And that's what we have seen time and time again throughout history. Uh, the communists were afraid of the people. The Nazis were afraid of the people. Every dictator, every police state, every tyranny fears the people. And so people should always be very fearful of government. There's a saying, you know, that an armed society is a polite society. I grew up in an armed society in the Arizona desert, and it was very polite. And so there's a lot of truth to that expression. And I think that America would be a lower crime country, if I can put it that way, that, a, that the people in America would be safer if they were able to defend themselves.